Welcome to Foreign Countries, Conversations in Archaeology with me, Ash Lenton. If you're enjoying Foreign Countries and you want to hear more episodes, please become a patron of the show for just $2 a month. Go to the website and click the patron button, foreigncountries.podbean.com. In this episode, we'll be talking about the earliest Scandinavian expansion across the North Sea and into the Atlantic. Later on, I'll be talking to Andreas Hennius and Dr. John Lungfist about Vendel period whaling in the Atlantic and the earliest whalebone gaming pieces found in Sweden. But first, I'm joined by Aina Hien Pettersen of NTNU, the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. Aina is working on a series of papers about the earliest expansion of Norse or early Vikings from the Nordvague to the Isles of Britain and Ireland. Her paper in the European Journal of Archaeology, the earliest wave of Viking activity, investigated exactly that. So welcome, Aina. This is a very familiar topic, which is often being reassessed. So could you just bring us up to date with the background? So this paper addresses the earliest phase of Viking activity in Britain and Ireland. And I often refer to Britain and Ireland as the insular areas in this paper. And this topic has been extensively discussed over the years in which a range of economic, demographic, environmental and political factors have been put forward. But also the chronology and nature of the earliest direct contacts across the North Sea have been hotly debated. In other words, when did the people from the western coast of Norway start to venture to Britain and Ireland? And what type of contact was this? And in these discussions, the relationship between the archaeological evidence and information recorded in Irish and Anglo-Saxon sources has been central, especially when it comes to discussion of chronology. The first written record of a possible Viking attack on insular land took place in Portland in Dorset in AD 789. And according to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, three ships of Northmen arrived near a royal residence where they killed the king's Revy, who rode out to meet them. And after the incident in Portland, the earliest recorded Viking raid on an ecclesiastical location is the very well-known attack on the monastery on Lindisfarne in northeastern England in June 793. In Scandinavia and many parts of Europe, it is usually this particular event which are officially marking the start of the Viking Age. And traditionally, this event has also been regarded as the starting point of direct contact across the North Sea, which has led to the widespread notion that any insular metalwork could only have reached Scandinavia after this event. So the historical evidence has always been pretty scant. What have archaeologists had to say about these dates? This view, it has been challenged, and especially in the 1990s and early 2000s. So instead of viewing the Lindisfarne attack as the first time the Norwegian Vikings entered the insular world, it was strongly argued that a pre-Viking phase of migration and trade to Northern Britain took place from the early to mid 8th century, or even earlier. And this debate centered around four aspects of archaeological evidence. The first was Viking graves with early types of brooches or weapons in Scotland. The second was early combs from Orkney made of Scandinavian reindeer antler. The third evidence is pollen analysis on the Faroe Islands indicating a pre-Viking presence. And finally, it is the fourth point, early insular objects in Viking graves. And where are we now? What's your point of departure? In the last two decades, the three first points of insular evidence of possible pre-Viking contact have been reviewed, but also largely dismissed. And in light of all the work which has been done fairly recently on the evidence from Britain and Ireland, I felt it was important to also look into the fourth and perhaps least studied element of evidence, and that is insular metalwork, found in early burials in Norway. This material has been discussed before, but that is more than 20 years ago. In the meantime, new finds have been discovered and theoretical debates have moved on. So I therefore felt that this material had the potential 
to shed new light on the nature of the earliest overseas expeditions. And I also noticed that much research on early Viking activity have taken for granted the importance of maritime skills and environmental knowledge when discussing pre-modern seafaring. So while the issue is often implied, it is rarely considered as a primary factor for the start and development of the Norse activity in the insular areas. So one can argue that although the sea journeys are completely vital, the journeys themselves had received somewhat secondary role in the narratives of the early Viking expansion in Britain and Ireland. So I felt that there was a gap in the knowledge there, which I wanted to look into. So in this article, I wanted to turn the focus on the sea voyages themselves, or more specifically, the importance of environmental learning and establishing cognitive landscapes to facilitate the Viking expansion. So you're looking at seafaring in the archaeology of Norway. How did you go about that? So the main evidence I use in this paper is a group of 16 early graves from Norway with insular metalwork. Uh, this material, it comprises vessels such as bowls and ladles, but the most common type is decorative Irish and British metalwork, which were reworked into Norse dress ornaments. Some very nice examples are, for instance, an Anglo-Saxon book mount from a place called Björka, which had been reused as a pendant on a buried woman. There's also several examples in this material of hinges of reliquia shrine, which had been reworked into brooches. And all of these 16 burials, they also contained brooches of the late 8th century or transitional types that survived into the early Viking Age. And it is very difficult to achieve a fine dating for this material. While we are confident that these burials represent the earliest wave of Viking activity, the brooches and weapons in them were in use both in the decades before and after the first recorded raids. So you simply cannot tell whether a brooch was buried in 780, so before the Lindisfarne raid, or the year 800 after the Lindisfarne raid. And therefore, the framework against which the imports can be interpreted becomes essential. And this is especially true for interaction models, which also has implications for how we think about the chronology and nature of the earliest Viking activity. Because today there is a general agreement that some sort of pre-Lindisfarne contact must have existed. But there have been few attempts to suggest any new models of how this interaction took place since the discussions 20, 30 years ago. So very simply explained, my method in this article is to draw together a range of evidence which can form the basis to propose a model of movement for the earliest Norse voyages across the North Sea. And I especially focus on the information that can be derived from the geographical distribution of the Norwegian material, while including the revised status of other archaeological evidence for early contact. So you were looking at new ways to interpret existing evidence, but you do provide some new evidence to the debate as well. I do present and discuss five new burials which have not previously been used to discuss the earliest Viking activity. And also, before I started working with this paper, none of the earliest burials had previously been radiocarbonated. And this is mainly due to the lack of bones being preserved in the graves. But one of the previous unpublished finds in this corpus, a cremation burial from a place called Jeta in central Norway, it contained more than 60 kilos of burnt bones, and some of them were contained in an insular bowl. And from this material, we collected a sample from animal bones, which we sent for dating. But unfortunately, but perhaps not unexpectedly, they came back with a very wide date range from about AD 693 to AD 868. But three of the dates had very similar results, indicating that the position date after AD 766 seems most likely, 
But again, it is not narrow enough to establish whether this particular insular bowl arrived in Norway before or after the earliest recorded raids. So what we proved with this is that there is not much point to doing radiocarbon dating on the earliest burials, because we still do not get a fine enough dating. And these dates, again, they underlie the difficulties in obtaining narrow enough dates for these early finds, which again highlights the importance of interaction models, which then can be discussed and hopefully move debates forward. Oh, so the problems with the dating still persist. So how are you able to remodel the Nordvig expansion? So in this paper, I discuss some main observations in the archaeological material, which are then used to propose a model of movement. And firstly, it is important to note that almost all burials with insular finds are located along the main sailing route of western coastal Norway. And this was called the Nordvei, or the Northern Way. And Norway have actually got its name because of this sailing route emphasizing the importance of maritime communication and maritime mobility for societies in Norway in early medieval times. So the distribution indicates that the earliest Vikings did indeed come from this area and the new finds emphasize this. And those who lived here would have mastered shipbuilding, seamanship and naval warfare to a level that was difficult to match for anyone in Northern Europe. And secondly, it is clear that many of the early insular finds comes from either burials or areas which appears to have been part of networks with contact further south on the continent. And this early mobility is also reflected through the archaeological material. For instance, one of the early burials from Shea in Trøndelag contained, in addition to the insular finds, rare Frankish textiles and brooches, which were probably produced in the Viking town of Ribe in Denmark. And likewise, an Irish produced bowl from Kvaroy in northern Norway was discovered together with a Frankish sword. And other burials from that area contained beads and brooches, which were probably made in Viking towns further south in Scandinavia, such as Spirka and Ribe. And this suggests that certain areas along the sailing route of Norway became informed about the insular lands through their travel and networks with urban markets further south on the continent. And this in turn may have encouraged voyages of exploration further west over the North Sea. Sailing up and down the coast is one thing, but heading out west into the unknown would demand some courage, wouldn't it? An awareness of Britain and Ireland through increased interaction with continental Europe would not have been enough to establish what became the seaway across the North Sea and further to England and Ireland. This process also involved a phase where people from coastal Norway started to travel in unfamiliar maritime environments and therefore had to acquire and make use of new environmental knowledge. And all of these thoughts are taken from colonization archaeology. It's not new thoughts, but what is new is that I apply it on uh, Viking Age material when discussing the earliest uh, contacts across the North Sea. And how do you see this expansion developing? So for the earliest Viking raiders, this new knowledge included locational knowledge of desired resources and favorable locations to attack such as uh, lightly defended places with portable wealth and potential slaves. But it also comprised the right maritime skills and knowledge needed not only to cross the North Sea, but also to move around in the challenging coastal waters of the Northern British Isles. Because this was not a straightforward journey. If you were from Northern Norway, for example, you first had to sail for a week or two along the Norway before you came to the best place in Western Norway for actually crossing the North Sea. Then you had to wait for favorable winds. And when you actually got as far as crossing the open waters to Britain, this was a rather unpredictable force where weather could turn rather suddenly. Land could at times remain out of sight for days, which required different navigation skills compared with sailing in sight of land, for instance. So at some point there was a leap of faith. We do know that people were worried about crossing 
open seascapes in early medieval times. Dangers involved with sea voyages are expressed in many Norse stories, which describe the struggle between the stormy, unpredictable and hostile sea. So while being a vital means of communication, the open sea was also recognized as a potential dangerous force, which represented a constant challenge to the seafarers. And after navigating this open seascape, the shortest and most direct route would take the Norwegian seafarers to the waters of Shetland or Orkney, before they then had to travel south to Ireland or England. And these are areas known for persistent sea fogs, strong tidal currents, and many skerries and submerged reefs. And there, again, there are plenty of stories in Norse Icelandic sagas and poems telling us about ships wrecks and ships getting lost in these areas. So when you look at this background, it seems apparent that the very sudden explosion of Viking attacks recorded in the late 8th and early 9th century could only have happened after a phase of environmental learning. So based on these observations, we can suggest a model of maritime movement, which involves three main stages. The first is the information stage, where seafarers along the Nord Way became increasingly informed about the insular land on the journeys to urban markets further south in Scandinavia and continental Europe. Looking at the evidence from burials, this may have happened around AD 750, 770. This activity triggered a phase of maritime expansion, which led to voyages of exploration further west over the sea, where some seafarers gained first-hand experience with the sea routes and maritime landscapes along Northern Britain and Ireland. So this is the phase of environmental learning. And again, looking at the evidence and burials, this may have happened around AD 770 to 790 in that area. Phase three, the earliest recorded raids, could only then have happened after a phase in which people along the Norweg had acquired a sufficient level of environmental knowledge to navigate in new seascapes and coastal environments. Hmm. So was Lindisfarne a long way down the chain? This model of movement clearly favours the notion of pre-Lindisfarne communication. You simply couldn't have carried out such a well-organised attack as that on Lindisfarne without having carried out this phase of environmental learning beforehand. It just doesn't seem possible when you look at the challenging journeys that it involved. But this model, it does not suggest that there was a long period of well-established migration and trade between Norway and the northern insular areas from as far back as the early to mid-8th century, which was suggested in the 1990s. But in this paper, then, I try to actually go into this rather controversial topic and come with a specific suggestions for how this prelims fan contact took place. Your main focus is the insular finds in Norway. What other work can you do with those finds? I'm continuing to work with insular finds from Norway, but while I in this paper investigate the earliest phase of contact between Scandinavia and Britain and Ireland, I am currently working on a paper which looks into the archaeological material which may inform us about the evolving Viking activity in the late 9th and early 10th century. And in addition to aspects of contact, I also research how artifacts from Britain and Ireland were perceived and incorporated into Norse practices after they arrived in Norway. These topics are being explored in five different papers. And in terms of the seafarers and the mobility of boatloads of people, what research would you like to see in the future? When it comes to how this paper benefits the discipline as a whole, I hope it perhaps can draw more focus on the importance of considering the itineraries of objects, how the transport over longer distances affected the way foreign imports were perceived by the new audience in new settings. Although I didn't get the room to explore that in detail in this paper, I'm doing that in some other papers that I'm working on. Because certainly in the case for the insular objects in Norway, 
it is clear, which I hope to have shown in this paper, that these long and potential dangerous journeys are likely to have increased the notion of difference between the Scandinavian homelands and the different lands of Britain and Ireland, which in turn shape the perception of the articles crossing the North Sea. Because while traditional studies of imported objects have mainly been concerned with tracing the place of origin and final destination, this paper also addresses the more elusive in-between journeys which actually led the articles to the Norwegian shores. And there has been a move towards these types of perspectives recently with a couple of edited volumes which specifically turns to the focus on the journeys of objects. The most recent volume is called Making Journeys, which was published just a couple of months ago. So the whole topics of uh, making journeys and archaeologies of mobility is very much forming a recent trend. So I hope this paper also can help to direct focus on movements and travels when analyzing artifacts which has traveled a rather long distance. Thank you very much for joining me, Aina Hian Pettersson. We've just heard that the Scandinavian expansion is usually dated from the middle or the end of the 8th century. But a brilliant piece of research, a paper in the European Journal of Archaeology on late Iron Age and early medieval whaling in Sweden, looks to move that expansion back a couple of centuries into the pre-Viking Vendel period. I'm joined now by two of the co-authors, Andreas Hennius and Dr John Lundqvist of Uppsala University and the Viking Phenomenon Project to consider the evidence of whalebone gaming pieces on the east coast of Sweden. So welcome first Andreas. The paper is about whaling patterns, but what is the primary evidence? In Sweden, osteologists usually look at bones found at, at the archaeological excavations, like remains from humans or livestock or animals that were hunted for prey. But when it comes to artifacts and manufactured items, the osteologist doesn't always look at them. They are just left for the archaeologist to make a very rudimental classification if it's like bone or, or antler or whatever. What we tried to do and what we found out was that a large majority of the gaming pieces that we find in burials are actually made from whalebone. And that gives you a whole lot of different ways of study the prehistory when it comes to the use of resources, the use of different animals, when it comes to contact networks, to trade within Scandinavia during this what we would say late Iron Age, but five, six, seven, eight centuries. So it all started with actually me and John working together with excavating huge grave mound outside the Uppsala in central eastern Sweden. And we found some of those gaming pieces. They are usually found in, in burials from the sixth century and onwards in big amounts. We could see that they were in, made from bone, but a very strange looking bone with a very coarse internal structure. And we had just received the analysis from this burial in Salmi in Estonia, where the osteologist had actually been studying the raw materials in the gaming pieces and found out that the gaming pieces and those boat burials were both from whale and from walrus. So we had the osteologist at this excavation to find out what type of bone material that was actually used for the gaming pieces. After a while, they could identify this coarse bone structure as whale bone. The consequences from this fact had not fully been investigated. They're asking questions like, where did the whale come from? Was it from hunting or stranded whales? Well, it was surely not from the Baltic Sea, even if there are some whales showing up in the Baltic every now and then, but there are no traditions of, of hunting whales in the Baltic. So the whale bone could, could be used to investigate things like resource exploitation, long distance trade and contact networks in the centuries before the Viking Age. And this was previously a rather inexperienced field. And welcome, John. So why are the gaming pieces so significant? When we discovered that it was gaming pieces made from whalebone, we, it, it was kind of a revelation because we knew there were hundreds of gaming pieces in the museum collections. And we could trace back many of them to the late Roman Iron Age, but because they, they were imported at first for, with influence from Rome and made of glass, and Scandinavians started to make them on their own. We knew also that there was a change in, in the gaming pieces, in the shapes of the gaming pieces around in the sixth century. Suddenly they, they started to take another shape and 
we've seen that in many cases in the collection, but it never really reflected upon what the material was. And then suddenly when it seemed to be made of whale bones, I think it was personally for me, it was a big aha experience that we have lots of, lots of whale bones, many, many whale bone gaming pieces. Right. So what is the nature of the gaming pieces? What is the established typology? We have had for a long time a typology of gaming pieces. Our earliest phase, they are pretty small and flat. But when we get into the sixth century, the gaming pieces becomes much, much bigger, like two or three centimeters in diameter and, and two or three centimeters high. And later on, they become more of three quarters of a sphere in the Viking Age. And when we get into the late Viking Age or early medieval period, they get much more exclusive designs yeah. or, or much more worked designs. So we have had this typology for quite a long time, but there has not been any discussions about the raw materials used. However, when you look at bone or antler, it's really, really hard to first of all get those big sixth century gaming pieces from a piece of antler. They're just too big. There are also gaming pieces made from hip joints from different types of animals. But those are pretty rare, but you have kind of assumed that they are made from hip joints when they are too big to be made from antler. But we actually see that the raw material used is also a precondition for the design. You can't make big hemispherical gaming pieces from antler. So the antler gaming pieces from the earliest times are flat and small because that's what the raw material gives you the possibilities to manufacture. When you start using the whale bones, you can also make larger gaming pieces. And when it comes to those late Viking Age, early medieval, much more elaborated designs, most of them are instead made from walrus. So we can see this change in design is connected to the chosen raw material. The raw material you use actually puts the limit for the type of gaming pieces that you can manufacture. Having established that they are whalebone, would that open up a whole host of research questions? Our questions are related to two different branches. There's one related to the trade and how, when are these gaming pieces introduced to the society or into the, to the trading system? And the other thing is, is the historical ecology questions. And these are interconnected, but they are also related to different questions. And I think we wanted to understand when they were introduced and how long they were used. And then our work has slowly evolved going into the historical ecology question and the questions around how we are overexploiting resources in the society and how that affects different species. That's highly integrated in what Andreas is doing in his PhD. We examine gaming pieces from about 200 burials as a starting point. And the basic question was, is, is it very common with whale bones? Is that the thing they have been using? And when, when do we see the first whale bones coming in? And when is that changed for something else? And since we got those results that most of them were made from whale bone, that triggers new questions on how did they get those whale bones? Was it stranded whales? Was it hunted whales? And how are they distributed? The, most of the, the gaming pieces we have been looking at and most gaming pieces that we find in the museum are from, all of them more or less is from southern Sweden and mostly from the eastern Sweden, which is pretty far from where we have any whales. So they also give you an, a way of examining trade networks and connections between different types of uh, landscapes and regions. In this time period, before the Viking Age and before we actually are discussing those types of trade networks and trade with mass-produced items and so on, so there are like different layers of questions. And in terms of social status, you make the point that these were not just elite artefacts. Were they widely used in the population? They're not only in the elite burials, but also in the middle class burials, which shows that it's not a very exclusive thing for a very small specific part of the population. It's something that has been produced in a rather big scale for most parts of Scandinavia and reached a lot of people. So when you see the statistics, it's not that exclusive as, as you might think. There has been a lot of research done on 
on gaming pieces and gaming in the Iron Age and the social settings for playing games and so on. So for us in our research, the gaming pieces is actually not the main thing. The gaming is not the main thing. It's the raw materials that has been used in manufacturing those items. And it happens to be that, that the gaming pieces are what remains of the whales. There was a lot of other products produced from the whale and the main reason for hunting whales was not producing gaming pieces, but it was probably for meat and blubber and all those other things. But the gaming pieces made from bone have survived those 1500 years, the remains that has been preserved. So this was large scale exploitation. What does that mean for your interpretations of the Viking age? This goes into the, it's related to the Viking Phenomenon Project where I'm working as a researcher and where Andreas is affiliated, where we discuss the origin of the Viking Age. There has been a tradition for, that goes back ever since the start of archaeology that the Viking Age from around 800 or the sack of the monastery in Lindisfarne in a few years earlier, where the Scandinavians started to have major contacts with Europe and, and the world. And that is also related to trade and production. But this is one of the signs of a couple of signs that show that large scale exploitations of the outlands and also large scale trade with other things than Roman luxury glass or something like that. These things started a couple of centuries before the Viking Age. And when the Viking Age starts, we have a major impact upon animal resources and probably animal population in, in uh, human exploitation. So the Viking Age with the plundering and Arabic silver coming to Scandinavia and Europe, that really begins around 800, but some aspects that we relate to the Viking Age start much earlier. We did spend quite a lot of, of thinking about how people got their hands on those whale bones. And the amount of whale bone gaming pieces in Swedish burials would probably be several thousands if we make a statistical calculation of what, how many burials that have been excavated and how many burials that have whale bone gaming pieces and so on. And we can see this clear typology of how they are designed. We have a clear design. We have a very consistent time period when this starts. We have huge production. And we have also examined some of those using SOMS analysis. So we have actually been able to pinpoint the specific whale species. There were like 28 whales that could have been hunted in, in the North Atlantic in the Iron Age. But all our samples that we have analyzed has shown it's the, the North Atlantic right whale. So there is a very specific species that they use and all of these taken together we interpret as a hunt for a specific type of whale you cannot produce all those items and produce all those gaming pieces for a huge market covering big parts of Scandinavia and rely on stranded carcasses and, and stranded whales. So we actually think that this is a sign of or an indication of that hunting for whales began at least around the 6th century, which is a couple of hundred years earlier than we have previously been discussing whale hunt. We have historical sources talking about whale hunt from the 9th century. There are indications from southern Europe of whale hunting, but we think that those gaming pieces and those whales that we are discussing was hunted along the Nor Norwegian coast, where you don't really discuss large-scale whale hunting until the Viking Age and the 9th or 10th century. So we have pushed the whale hunting backwards in time for a couple of centuries. And from here, where does this take research in the future? I think from the historical ecology perspective, we are, we are doing more SUEMS analysis now, so we can, we can have a broader picture of, of getting more firm identifications of the species that was hunted and used for the gaming pieces. So we're securing the data more, and we will publish an article within one year about a deeper analysis. And I think this is one species, and but there is a tale from a Viking trader called Othar in the middle of the Viking Age. He, he goes north and, and rounds the Kola Peninsula in the hunt for walrus, because it has probably been extinct in Norway. So he, he extends to the borders of his known world to hunt for more walruses. And they probably found more walruses on Iceland in, when they discovered Iceland's the Vikings, and they killed them off in one generation. And then they went on to Greenland, and as James Barrett and other researchers in Great Britain has shown, they put a high pressure on the walruses in Greenland. 
So this fits into this pattern. And I think we can I think we can make it much broader and start to discuss the early impact on big animals in this age much more. So I think we're just in the start of, of exploring this. We have also one article from John concerning the hunt for bears in northern Sweden, where we can actually see that the hunting pressure was during periods very, very high, and the bears were almost extinct already in the 6th century in certain parts. So we have this movement in Scandinavian archaeology for the moment, trying to use the empirical archaeological materials, especially bones, not only for understanding the societal impact of those items, but also the ecological impact. What types of raw materials used and how does this affect the environment? We have uh, Stephen Ashby and, and Sören Sindbeck who has done research on reindeer antler with reindeer trade from the Arctic Scandinavia down to Denmark and the walrus and this one. So, so it's several researchers and uh, several research projects going on using similar topics and similar methods for using the archaeological material in, in a new way to answer new questions. And you think that biological research in the Baltic into bear and fish populations, for example, that can be advanced as well? We have no idea about what the populations looked like before the mid-19th century. And in uh, Australia and the United States, we can follow how, how the Western world industry has devastated uh, beavers and bears or Australian dingo or, or, or whatever. But we can't do that in Europe because it's, it started much, much earlier, the, the industrial exploitation. So, and that is very fun with that we can see that we really, really can get some highly interesting data and be, really be surprised when, when we get this data. And that, that feels important compared to some other stuff we do in archaeology sometimes. Yeah, I can certainly see that. Thank you very much for joining me, Andreas and John. And thanks again to Aina Hien-Petterson. And I hope you'll join me next time on Foreign Countries.